Today's topic, if you've never been to one of our coffees, today's topic is about planning ahead for campus visits. And these college counseling coffees are deep dives into specific topics. Next week, we'll be talking about standardized testing. Bring extra coffee to that. The week after that is athletic recruiting. These are all things that we cover in our college counseling class, in our parent meetings, so kids and parents have other opportunities to hear this. You're here to get a deep dive. So my name is Jen Fitzpatrick. I'm one of the college counselors. I'm joined by Darnell Haywood and Carla Crucker. We're the three college counselors. And then we have two very special guests, Jen Wynn from the College of Worcester and Mateo Rumsberg from Ohio University. So we're really gonna save most of our talking points for them. Um, here's what we're gonna go over today. The why, hows, and whens of college visiting. So what we really wanna talk about in these slides is, uh, actually, let me, let me get a show of hands. How many parents of high school juniors, raise your hands, Special love in our hearts for you. High school sophomores? Okay, sophomores playing ahead. Freshmen? Okay. Any middle school parents? Both. Oh, Lower school parents? Okay, good. Okay, here we go. So our target really, we're really focusing on sophomore and junior parents here. We're glad you're here to think about this and plan ahead. This does take some thought and, and forethought. We wanna to try to give you some tips to make this successful, but our, our biggest takeaway, one thing we want you to think about in the beginning is, this is really, the meat of this is done in junior year. So the big college visiting, the week long, getting out there and visiting schools, that's what you save for the junior year after you've had some meetings with your college counselors, after you've done some college research, after you have a, a junior year GPA and maybe one round of test scores. We would argue that in the sophomore year, if you're going to visit grandma and there's a college nearby, if you're driving somewhere for vacation, there's a school, if you're um, alma mater, if you're going back there for a reunion weekend and they're offering tours, we think that's great. But to do the major college visits in the freshman and sophomore years is a little bit too early. Your kids really aren't uh, educationally ready for that. Um, there are some pluses to the pandemic. There are a lot more uh, online tours and videos and things you can watch. We do want to be cognizant of the fact that, there, that because of COVID, some places are still limiting the number of visits. So you're going to hear us often talk about planning ahead, planning ahead, planning ahead. You're going to see some examples of this. There are times when things close up because they're just at their limit. So that might be 50 spots on a tour, 100 for an info session, because COVID is still limiting numbers on campuses. We wanna be really honest about that. We think the majority of schools are open for business as usual, but there are still limited spots. The good news is, before you go and visit, say, schools in California, if your kid's like, Mom, I really wanna to go to the West Coast. Okay, great. Let's watch some online videos first. Let's watch some online tours. Let's get some info sessions in there before we buy plane tickets and make that investment of going that far away. We have so many great schools in Ohio. We're gonna talk about those first visits being here locally and taking advantage of some of those things. I'm gonna pass it over to Ms. Krucka, who's gonna take you through the next steps. Awesome, thank you. So Jen kind of talked about this already a little bit, but kind of going through the why of visiting. You probably wouldn't buy a house without doing a little research on Zillow first, talking to your realtor, and then going to see it. So we want you to be informed consumers. You do this in a lot of other aspects of your life and this shouldn't be any different. So this is part of that college process to be that informed consumer. You know, you also, you know, we want you to understand the guidebooks and the online tours, it's always sunny. People are always smiling. It never rains, it never snows. Um, and so we want you to, to kind of differentiate your experience from what you're seeing in the guidebooks. You know, they're, they're marketing pieces and they're beautiful and they're wonderful, but you, you also need to add a little bit more into it, kind of that Yelp piece. You need to kind of get the whole picture first. Um, there is a huge benefit to looking at different ranges of colleges, right? We're talking with your juniors a lot about applying to different ranges of colleges. So don't just go and see the, the most selective colleges out there. We want you to, to see a range of selectivities and we're gonna talk a little bit about great tips on how to do that. Um, and then one of the things, you know, the ethos of the school, it's hard to really understand what that is when you're reading a guidebook or looking online. You can hear what they're saying about it, but what do you feel when you're walking on that campus? And kind of lastly, we're going to talk, I think Jen's going to really dive into this, so I won't take any thunder from her, but it's really important that students see colleges for their own research, but there is the little added benefit of that demonstrated interest piece, which, like I said, Jen will talk about. Okay, 
So we are really in the throes of talking to your juniors about this. This is something that we're in the middle of actually class this session, talking about um, how to register for college visits and what that part looks like online. This is something, parents, that you can actually really help with. There's a lot of logistics involved. There's a lot of pre-planning involved. And teenagers are wonderful. May not always be their strong suit, and so this is where you can kind of step in and think about, um, you know, how to visit the campuses in terms of scheduling and what kind of places we're looking at. You know, we talk a lot about. Um, and I think we're going to show you physically what it looks like on a school screen in just a minute. But we talk a lot about once you're on the tour, this is really for your student. Of course, you're to be looking around, taking some mental notes. But when you're done and you're having that cup of coffee at the local coffee shop. You know, ask those questions that are deeper than just, did you like it? I liked it too. You know, so I really want you to think about what questions might, you know, what, what were your thoughts when the tour guide said this? What did you think when you walked around campus? What feelings are you getting? And let them really drive that conversation because we want them to be the informed consumer just as much as and then lastly, as I promised, um, here is that one of those screens that I wanted to kind of show you. There are lots of, of steps to this particular process, but visiting and registering ahead of time is probably step number one. After you make the list of places that you are thinking of visiting, and this is kind of where we're going to go, going onto their admissions webpage and clicking on visits and seeing what the options are. You know, I think what we have here is we have some admitted student information, we have prospective student information, so they do different programs for different subsets of their applicant pools. And then you can see that calendar down there and you can click. There's usually a legend, I'm sure there is one on the screen, but it tells you what these colors mean. For example, if it's not green or gold color, my guess is they're not offering a visit that day. Or, it's like, yes, that's um, or it's full. And one thing we learned from class this past week as we kind of started this, we were showing students how to find this information on the website. Um, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday classes, there was a 9 a.m. visit available at the University of Cincinnati by Thursday. That visit was gone. So again, making sure you're planning ahead more than just, oh, it's Tuesday, let's go see if we can visit a school tomorrow, because that may not be an option for you. And then lastly, Thinking about that range of school piece, you're not gonna go to upstate New York and only visit Cornell. We really want you to think about other schools that are in that geographic region. You can get generally a couple of school visits in in a day, so if you're spending a weekend or a couple of days different, you know, in one location, you can get quite a few schools. And that's where we can come into play and really help you if you're having, you're saying, this is where I'm going for spring break, where can I be visiting? We certainly want you to take it in all the schools that are in that particular region. So um, I think now I'm going to pass it off to Darnell. Good. So um, just a couple of things to mention. So parents, I think you're seeing your role is both thinking about, um, and I'm going to say one thing on this, um, thinking about being a driver, thinking about being a planner, looking at your family calendar, and seeing where this fits in. Um, students are really um, don't really have ideas about that, and I would say that advanced planning that falls in your category. For the kids, once you get to campus, what falls in their purview is you are going to let them take the lead once they get there. So you're going to set up the logistics, but then when you get there, the student is going to be the one saying. Hi, um, my name is Darnell, I'm here for the 10 o'clock tour. And if they're kind of afraid to do that, you say, this is your process, remember this is a tour for you, this is how we're gonna do it. And both when you think about the geographic region, what is um, interesting to think about in this process is pushing your limits of what you think you want. So look at something smaller than your child thinks they might like. Look at something larger than they think they might like. And for you as well, you have preconceived notions of what this will be, or what the colleges will be. And what we have learned over time is you learn as much from seeing places you like as from seeing places that you dislike. So you, you having that idea and that range and going there. Another little thing about the visiting when you go, do not start junior parents with your child's first choice dream college going to visit that, you want to practice first. You want to practice. You want to get them used to seeing what a visit is like. You don't want the stress to be there. And you want them to feel confident and see that in the next slide. 
um, you know, what to, to, to sort of get used to visiting schools. So if you think about this as a job in the junior year, you know, we would say kids visit kind of eight to ten schools um, over the course of the year. If you get to the end of spring break and you haven't visited two or three schools, your, your child's going to feel behind. The rest of the classmates have already sort of done that. And so figuring out during this time when you're going to see them because the pace kind of um, accelerates. You'll see we have some days off school. Um, then you'll see that we have spring break. And summer summer is a, can be a time to visit if that works with your schedule, but you need to be aware that if a college is on the smaller side and there are no students there, your child is not really getting a feel for what the campus life is like. So you really want to think about how you plan that and when you plan it and what you um, go see. Um, Jen and Mateo are going to talk a little bit about some of these open houses versus tours and information sessions. Interviews, um, those would really fall, it's mainly at schools that are on the smaller side and usually later in the junior year. You want your child to be aware of that, but that's something that we practice in, um, in college counseling class, and I don't really need to go into the rest of that. And this, um, and this visiting colleges, again, we want you all to get used to sort of seeing these pages, and guess how you find all this? Anybody? Yes. How do you find out where the visits are happening? On their website. On the website. Google. It's very easy. You know, College of Worcester, admissions, open houses, visiting. So just go in and take a look at that. So with that now, I'm going to pass it over to Jen Lynch. Oh, oh to Mateo. Oh, to me. One more. One more. Okay, one more. I forgot. You know, one of these mornings. Um, but uh, so, so you'll see that this is what we're doing right now with kids in, in, their, um, in their college counseling class is we are teaching them about requesting information from colleges, joining college mailing lists. And we ask them in the class, but I'm going to ask you, why do they request information? To get information. Exactly. <laughs> to you learn, I don't know, I didn't hear what you said. I got you. To get information. Yeah, I mean, this is learning. This is digging in. We want them to learn about schools. We don't want you to just say, well, Johnny said this at school, so that's what I think of that school. Um, we want them to go in and get that. It's also a way to demonstrate interest. And for instance, in my family, when my son joined mailing lists based on the wonderful advice of the college counseling team, then all of a sudden we got a flyer at home. Oh, there's a visit on February 11th at this school. And that made us realize, okay, well, we'll go out and visit that school on that day. Um, it really makes a difference. Okay, so now I'm gonna pass it on to the wonderful Jen Winge. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Jen. Thank you so much, and good morning, everyone. Hi. Oh, good morning. So, <laughs> um, I'm really excited to be here. This is my 26th year or so working in uh, higher ed and college admissions. I worked on the other side of the desk for a little bit at the Kiske School outside of Pittsburgh, so um, I'm really happy to be back on the college side and, and have a chance to talk with all of you. Um, we're, you know, it's, a, it's important to note that we want to make sure um, as informed and savvy consumers, you decide uh, when it's appropriate to make that visit. I, we talked about the different types of visits, whether it's a info session, whether it's a program, uh, making sure that you're not interviewing too early. So, um, you know, just understanding when and, and how um, that visit um, uh, is appropriate to your child and, and in what time in their, in their experience. But why do we want you to visit? Well, it probably seems pretty obvious. Um, we, we are truly partners in this process with you. We want to make sure um, that we're providing authentic, accurate information, but also having a chance to connect with all of you as a family and getting to know your child um, on a deeper level. Certainly schools like Worcester make time to do that and, and provide opportunities to do that. And so it's, you know, it's important to note that you know, we want to make sure that they're making a good decision and a good match in this process just as much as you do. Um, and so as part of being that informed uh, consumer, what I like to think of like as the savvy consumer, visiting is the most authentic experience, right? We talked about seeing a virtual tour online, having a chance to look through the, the guidebooks, 
but obviously having a chance to connect with the students, to do some people watching and observing and taking those tours that will provide that most authentic experience. It's also the best way to start doing some of that um, compare and contrast, right? Uh, you know, starting to keep what I, you know, I recommend students keeping some kind of journal, whether it's on their phone in the cloud or, or it's on notebook paper, making sure that as you do those multiple visits, as soon as you have a chance to get back in the vehicle and start driving away, you take um, in those immediate reactions and reflections, right? What was most exciting um, about that visit, what you're going to remember most, and also, you know, some things that maybe weren't so great that didn't necessarily fit. So taking an inventory of that experience is really helpful as well. Um, I also think it's good to know that there are opportunities for us to get to know your student. It depends, again, on that type of experience, right, um, and, and when that's most appropriate. But at minimum, um, you know, as you put your student in the driver's seat and giving them that ownership as they check in themselves and, and introduce themselves, at minimum, I think it's wise for them to say, you know, is there someone I can um, meet that is going to be reading my application? Or is there someone that is assigned to my high school and working with the college counseling office here at Columbus Academy? Um, and so you may not have necessarily an interview scheduled for that day, um, but that person may be in the office. It's a chance to make an in-person connection um, because that can be quite memorable for them. Um, to be able to say hello, um, to make uh, you know an introduction, to share a little bit about themselves, but certainly for us as staff members, um, that's quite memorable. As we read thousands of applications, those moments are just as meaningful for us. So I think minimally that's really important as well. Um, but what else can we learn through an interview process or a conversation? I always say context is so important in this process, right? As we review applications, we take in the full context, the high school, um, the curriculum, the student themselves and their individual learning styles and interests and talents. Um, and so, you know, obviously we know that um, it's an opportunity when we have a conversation to learn more about that context. Um, giving a student a chance to share more about their classroom experiences, the ups, the downs, things that they might not have time or ability to share with us through their application. Um, those conversations can be very meaningful uh, when, when they're ready to have them. So knowing that we want to learn a little bit more about the student while they're on campus as well. Uh, what should you be asking us? Um, you'll get great questions and I think that checklist helps with some of those um, things um, from your college counseling office and, and of course the, the class that your students are in are going to learn a lot about that. But I love the deeper questions, right? One of my favorite questions that fo folks ask is, okay, well we just visited, well let's think, within an hour and a half drive we have Denison and Oberlin and Kenyon and Case Western just around the College of Worcester. So what makes Worcester distinctive, right? Ask, ask us, what, makes, what do you believe makes um, this institution unique? And then have that's time after that visit to ref, have time to reflect with your student to say, okay, did that resonate with you? Did you get excited about what some of those distinctions were as well as what you observed? You know, understanding um, what um, those authentic experiences are, or what makes that school unique or, or, or tick. And then, of course, I think it is very wise to learn a little bit more about who are going to be the mentors, who are going to be the supporters of your student while they're there. So asking questions about not only academic advising, but wellness and counseling, and how students are making connections not only with their peers, but with our staff and faculty. So those are just some examples of what you can learn and should be asking for us. And then most importantly, or not most importantly, but certainly something that I think everyone's interested in knowing about is, are you actually sort of tracking when we show up on your campus or when we're visiting your website? And overall, the majority, yes, we are tracking that information. It's important to us, right? These days with the ease of applying to schools, the common application, the coalition application, um, this has you know, created wonderful access for students across the world, but it also has created a dilemma for us that more and more students are applying to us, and it's harder for us to understand what their interest level is. And that's where this idea of demonstrated interest comes from. So um, <clears throat> when we've taken a survey of all of the colleges and universities in the country, and, um, we have a national organization called NACAC, 
Um, just under half of those schools will say that um, showing interest and you know building a relationship and the student taking that initiative is either deemed very important or moderately important. So there are schools that don't track this. It's not as important to them. And so it's good to know that. And I think it's okay to ask, you know, does demonstrated interest play a part in an overall admission decision at your institution? Um, but if anything, it's still just a good practice, right? We have a, um, a, a, a phenomenon called a stealth applicant. When I say, you know, we don't really want students to be a stealth applicant. What do you think I mean by that? They just submit your parents know about Oh, okay. So uh, junior parents, most of you, a lot of you are. So who, what do we mean by that? Does someone answer? Oh, come on. I'm going to start calling on people. <laughs> Submitting an application without any interest. Submitting an applicant. Without any interest, demonstrated. Right, so submitting an application because we will, a student will create a new record in our system with just an application. We have no other past history of understanding how they learned about us. So the internet has allowed students to do all their shopping online and to do all their research without even going to our website sometimes, right? Like they can go to Niche, they can go to College Confidential or whatever they want to do to do their shopping. And so we're trying to help students not do that because those are typically the students that may not get the second look, right? Because we don't, we don't believe that they may be as invested and interested in us. Um, and so as we're selecting and building that class, um, they may not make that cut. So it is important to take those steps in what we call demonstrated interest. And that, I feel like it's almost like dating. It can start online and then it can, go, can evolve into an in-person connection, right? So you can be stealth at first, in some ways you can, you can be online, but eventually you wanna fill out that request for information form. You will um, have a chance maybe to go to niche.com or capex.com and create a profile and add that school to your list. Um, and eventually, you may want to click on an email and actually fill out a form when that school is, is communicating with you directly. So it's, I think that you know can start small, but we are actually tracking that information. And in fact, if you want to show an example, I'll give I'll pull the curtain up a little bit. Now, most institutions have a CRM or a communication um, platform that allows us to to track that information. Now, I know this could be for a good reason. Um, so this is what we call a dashboard. I know you can't see all the details, but I'll show you the colors here. But uh, you know, a student's name would be at the top. We'd know where their hometown is in their high school. Um, but this is just a quick sort of snapshot for a, a counselor to be able to say, okay, let me understand. You know, has this visit? Thank you. I'm sorry, am I moving around? We're going to do a duet. Okay. Um, has, has this student visit? I can I cover the, thank you, very good tip, excellent. <laughs> so um, this is just an example of that dashboard and so just to understand how we track that process and, and those connections, here's one example. We actually sort of have a heat map or color code where you know this student first came into our system in July of 2018 and through their their process right and probably this was their sophomore year moving in to their senior year we can see um, interactions through uh, you know opportunities to um, click or email um, click on emails we have um, a login um, opportunities into their application portal later in the process uh, we have um, emails sent and emails open are the orange. So this just gives us an idea of how they've cultivated a relationship with us and invested us over time. So I don't want to you know, make folks <laughs> wary of this process. It's really about building a relationship and investing time and, and researching and doing, and doing healthy research. All right, I'm going to turn things over to Ohio University's Rep. Mateo. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. So when we talk about demonstrated interest, I think it's really important to understand 
Really that demonstrated interest comes in to play more depending on the selectivity of a school. So a school that has limited spots for enrollment and they really have to think hard about what, what students they want to admit are probably going to use demonstrated interest more than a school that doesn't necessarily have enrollment limits. Um, and so, for example, at Ohio University, yes, I absolutely see all of the information, all the ways that your students are engaging with us, but it really, for us, we use that demonstrated interest more when we're looking at a student who might be on the bubble of whether or not we should admit them. Right? So that's, that's some of the differences that you'll see in terms of types of schools and how they utilize demonstrated interest. Now when we think about the college visit, I'm curious, how many of you have already done a college visit with a, one of your students? All right, so what did you learn from your visits that you've already done? We okay, they're helpful for meeting with people there. How were they helpful? Uh, they provided a lot of, uh, you know, if you ask for specific programs, if they know, if they come to their notes, um, they will give you, okay, um, what years you need to be, uh, what they call it, uh, show the, the desired readers, mm -hmm. um, and, and claim whatever you, you want to learn and all this stuff. Right, so the, the, the important piece of, of his answer was, making sure you're asking specific questions versus general questions, right? Um, so that you can get that detailed information that you're looking for. How about you? You had your hand raised. We stayed overnight, so we were able to see the school and meet with some of their students that are acting as ambassadors to talk about specific areas of interest and got the tour. But to someone's point that mentioned talking to the students like off time, we had out at an ice cream shop for about an hour and learned a lot. Right, so that student interaction is super important. Being able to watch, observe, talk with current students. In fact, whenever I am talking with families, particularly I'm the one that gets up and does the big welcome at our open houses and you know gets people ready, I always end by saying you want to save your most difficult questions for the true experts on our campus, and that's our current students because they're the ones that are living that life right now, right? So as you think about what is it that you can learn from the visit, you know, yes, you can learn the specifics of academic programs. What does it take to get in to the college? What does it take to get into an actual program? Are there auditions? You can learn about financial aid and scholarships. You can learn a lot of the details, the, the process-oriented things, but you also want to think about how do you get to that feeling and that experience, that student experience, right? Because your students are the ones that are going to really be experiencing that full time if they go to that, whatever institution they go to, right? So when you are interacting with folks on campus, I think it's important to understand you're going to be interacting with what we might call administrators or professionals or faculty members. Those are the ones that you want to ask the more detailed process-oriented questions, things like that. When you're interacting, when your students are talking with current students, so they're on the campus tour, they're visiting the residence halls, you're hanging out at the ice cream shop, right? The questions directed to current students should be more about what is your experience like? What's it like to be a student? Because if you ask one of my tour guides about the financial aid process, they're gonna know a little bit, but it's usually going to be based off of their own experience. So it's better to ask the financial aid question of our financial aid advisor than it is one of our current students. So I think as you are planning your visits and you're thinking about the questions that you should be asking, kind of keep that in mind in helping to prep your student to ask the right questions to the right people, right? That's super important. Um, when I think about, you know, what should you be asking us? Okay, those are important questions. So tell me about the programs and, and what makes you unique. Okay, I will be the first person to tell you pretty much every school is going to say you can have a research experience on our campus. <laughs> you know, you're going to hear those things over and over and over again. So tell me specifically what does research look like 
in this program, right? So a lot of times when we think about research, we think about the sciences or engineering, but we don't necessarily think about dance. We may not necessarily think about the business. So what does research look like in a particular program? So again, it's getting down to more specifics versus then the generalities, right? I love to tell students and families, when you are talking with our students, I want you to ask three questions. What do you like about the campus? What don't you like about the campus? And what's one thing that surprised you when you got here, right? We've talked already about the fact that we've got great brochures and websites and everything looks honky-dory and, you know, it's a great place. But every institution has its downside. I don't know a campus around that parking is not a concern of anyone on campus, right? So if parking's an issue, how do students get around that, right? And it's okay to hear negative things because that's the reality of what that campus is. Now there's lots of other questions, you know, your students should be asking. I love the, the notion of let your student drive the conversation, but you as a parent can do a lot in the prep work as you think about preparing to go to visit campuses. Uh, so, well, before we jump to the next slide, let me talk a couple other differences on this slide. So I've had the opportunity, I've been doing this similar to Jen, about 26 years. I've worked at four different institutions, two small private institutions, and then now two large public research institutions. And you're gonna find some very stark differences between visiting a small school versus visiting a large school. Number one is probably gonna be the amount of time that you spend on campus walking around campus. Okay, you go to a small campus, and you might actually be able to get through your information session and your campus tour in maybe an hour to an hour and a half. If you go to a large campus, our campus tour at Ohio University is 90 minutes, just the walking part, right? So I think that's an important thing as you are thinking about preparing for your visits is how much time do you need to plan for your campus visit? Is it an open house, which is an all day kind of thing? Or is it a three hour or four hour experience or a 90 minute experience? Because that's gonna help you as you think about, am I gonna be able to visit multiple campuses in a day? Right, so be cognizant of that. Um, also, I think it's important to understand the, the geography of the campus, of whether it's flat or it's hilly, because um, you can get your workout as you're doing a campus tour at Ohio University. Um, but those are some of the things that you want to know. Also thinking about who are you going to be able to visit with at a larger school. Sometimes it's more difficult to get individual time with particular people, whereas at a smaller school, oftentimes you will find that faculty will be willing to make some time for you when you come to visit, because typically they don't have as many visitors coming. Right? So just be kind of mindful of, of the size of the institution and how much time you should plan. Now, my favorite thing to tell folks as well is when you go on campus, go eat in the dining hall if you can and just sit and watch and be observant as you're in the dining hall or as you're walking around campus and encourage your student to think about what are the interactions that they're seeing between other students? How are they grouping together? Is everyone kind of just doing their own thing or are folks you know, coming together and chatting and having fun. What does it look like when you are checking in? How are you greeted? How do you see students interacting with other staff on campus? Because those are some really good telltale signs of what kind of the campus community is and how welcoming it is and how comfortable people are on that campus. Okay. Yeah, but I just have one more story to tell us. When I was taking my um, children with me one time for my job, I had to visit a lot of colleges walked into one dining hall and I said, let me, let me see this. And, and my son said, do you have to have a beard to go to college? Because everybody in the dining hall had a beard, so that told us a little bit about the college, and I wouldn't have noticed that. But it was a very funny child observation. I was like, I guess that's true. I should only recommend this to kids who might want a beard. <laughs> 
the the other piece that I'll tell you is is not just thinking about the campus, right? When your child goes off to college, they're joining a larger community, right? So it's not just about the campus community, but what's the city or the town that they're going to be going into? And what's that like? So when you are planning your visit, I encourage you to plan time to explore the city or the town that they're in, right? Athens, Ohio is a small college town, and that's not going to be for everyone. Um, I was very intentional about wanting to move my family to a small college town after having lived in a larger urban area, right? It's just a different experience, not better or worse, but different. And it's important to understand that your student is not going to be on campus 24 seven, right? So I, I think you want to, to explore the, the surrounding community as well. Okay, as we think about, we've talked a little bit about scheduling. Thinking about planning ahead, and this is where, you know, we've talked about let your student drive the questions, but you can help prep them for those questions. So I often tell sophomore and junior families, start thinking about what is that college experience that you want? What are you looking for in a college? So are you wanting a big school? Are you wanting a small school? Do you want to be in a smaller community or a larger urban center? Um, you know, do you want lots of opportunities to get involved? Do you want the outdoors? Because these are the types of questions when you are comparing and contrasting schools, when you're visiting multiple schools, you want to ask the same kinds of questions so that they can do that compare and contrast. And, and do they like what they heard? It doesn't resonate with them. You know, I'll be the first person to tell you that, you know, Ohio University could have everything your student wants in a college based off of the research that they do. And then they get to campus, and if they don't feel comfortable there, their ability to be successful is going to be hindered. And we all want our students to be successful. So that's really the power of that campus visit, is to be able to try a campus on for size, and do I feel comfortable there? Am I seeing students having experiences that I want to have, right? Are there opportunities for me to experience things that I never thought I could? Right? These, keeping your, your, helping your student keep their, their options open and their minds open to new experiences. So those are some of the other things you can encourage them to look at. Like, oh, there's the climbing wall in the rec center. Have you ever gone climbing? Like, is that something you want to do? Like that after visit conversation? Like those are some of the things that you can help point out to your student that you see just to get them thinking about, like, are these the types of experiences that they're looking for? After the visit is a super important. I love um, Jen's recommendation of, you know, jotting down your initial thoughts. You know, it's not only what did you learn during your visit, but also, like, what's the feeling? You know, I've talked to some families where they, they left campus and they're like, this is absolutely it. Like, this is where I want to go. And I've also heard some families say, absolutely not. And that's okay. Like, that's part of the, the, the value of the visit is to really get a sense of, is this some place? And this is why we want you to visit during your junior year, because we want you to get a sense of, is this some place that I actually want to submit an application? Right? We're seeing students submit upwards of 20 applications, and that's great, lots of options, but when they get admitted to most of those, it's really hard to make that final decision. So if they do the research in advance and are able to narrow down the number of schools that they actually apply to, it's going to make the end result easier for them when they have to make those decisions. And the campus visit can really play an important role in that research, in that decision making of where am I even going to submit an application? Yes, ma'am. So following the visit, I'd like to get your in your colleagues' perception of when people call the school, if they call admissions, if they call counseling after they visited because they have questions or want to have some level of engagement. Is that perceived as is that something you welcome, or is that something that turns you off because of the workload that you have? Okay, so the question is. How do we feel about after the visit if you call us and, and ask additional questions, whether that's to show demonstrated interest or you know, just to do some follow-up? 
I encourage everyone when they are meeting with students, when they are meeting with people on campus, make sure that they get their contact information. And the reason being is I guarantee it, you are going to leave at least one campus, get 10 minutes away, and your student's gonna go, or you're gonna go, ah, oh, I wish I would have asked this question. If you've got the contact information of the people that you meet with, you can definitely do that follow-up, and we encourage that. At the end of the day, we want students to get the information that they need to make informed decisions. And so when we talk about there are no dumb questions, there are literally no dumb questions. Because those are the things that are important to your student. Those are the things that are important to you. So please reach out. And, and if a question comes up and you don't know who to contact, yes, the Office of Admissions is, is usually a great first start. May I add something to that? So one of the great things that came out of the pandemic was also this idea of virtual um, conversations and connections. So every school is different, so keep that in mind. But what I have valued greatly is we um, tend to send the admissions counselor responsible for Columbus Academy or even from um, the senior leadership, we'll send a follow-up email to our visitors and say, if you do have questions, you can schedule a 15 minute, a 20 minute conversation. We, we have them in half hour slots and you can do that on, online. And that can be just for the parents only or it can be combined for the family or the student only, it's open. And so that has been really valuable. Um, and I've, I mean, we do it almost in every stage of the process, like after a financial aid offer is there, I offer that again. But know that, that that virtual access has created and opened up those avenues even more, so. Thank you. So you see us just whispering back here. The questions that um, I think you don't want to take somebody's time, like, do you have a psychology program? If you can Google it, don't ask it, right? Um, we also have kids who are like, oh, I read somewhere, which always makes us nervous, I read somewhere that I should email my admissions counselor once a week because then they'll know my name. They'll know your name for all the wrong reasons, okay? So that's not something you should do. I think legitimate questions that you need professional help for, absolutely, but this notion of, it's gotta be me, they've gotta know my name, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call them or email them or follow them on social media, and I'm gonna be that kid, don't be that kid. Because you're that kid, right? See the difference? And then my final comment will be that we've been talking about, you know, starting your college visits your junior year. Recognize that you can go back and do a return visit during the senior year. And oftentimes there are deeper dive programs. So, you know, for example, um, an open house is kind of a, a come one, come all in the fall. And, but we, many institutions have similar type open house experiences but are more for admitted students because again the information that we want to share with an admitted student is usually at a deeper dive or a different level of things that they need to know as they move through the next steps. Um, it's also important to recognize that many institutions will have college specific visits. So like at Ohio University, we have our daily general visit that you can come, but we also have some days where our colleges are doing specific visits for their college. So if you're interested in arts and sciences or engineering, you can come and have a more focused visit, right? So there are, when you think about the variety of visit opportunities, the one that you do your, your student's junior year is really about that information gathering, experiencing the campus, but then you still can come back and do additional visits as is appropriate and as you, you and your students have time. So with that, I'll close up. I'm gonna go back to one more slide here that I think is really helpful to see because we keep turning, throwing around these terms research and I think that actually, it takes some sort of understanding what that is. So I think before you go to a college or university, you wanna know the basic facts. Size, number of graduates versus undergraduate students on campus. You wanna know location. You wanna know information about admission selectivity, how many students they accept, how many students they don't. 
Um, you want to know, is there, uh, do they admit by major? You want to understand, do they have different schools? You want to understand just some basic facts about the university. And I'll tell you that that information um, can be found really easily for um, our juniors in Maya Learning, which is our uh, database that all the juniors are becoming familiar with. We've walked through with them all of the tabs so that they can see that information. Um, I, I would say for uh, grade 10 parents, something called College Navigator gives you all the standard information that you would need. That's the old telephone directory information that you would get about schools. Then what we have here are a couple of things. These are um, niche. Um, we call this, this is organized gossip, okay? And a little bit of cathartic bitching. Okay, so just so you know, it's a little bit of that. So if you think about what that is, it's, that's what this offers. And these are what we call opinion or review pieces. But they give a narrative about schools that I find can be really helpful for students. So you both want to know the general facts and you might, and you also may want to know a little bit of a narrative, because you can agree or disagree with the opinion, but it can be kind of a starting place for you to read about it. So when you go to the campuses, um, it's particularly the junior year, you want to have done that research from the beginning, and then you form your own opinions on top of that. Now we're going to go to some lessons learned, and we're going to take turns sharing that. Okay, so we're going to stretch our legs and all come up here. Um, the most important thing, and if you've been to any of our presentations, you'll hear us keep coming back to this topic, keep joy in the process. When this gets stressful, it's your job as a parent to recognize that and to abandon the mission and do something else. So for instance, you should really only visit two schools in a day. You may logistically say, I'm a planner, Jen. I can get in three or four. I don't doubt that. I know some of you, you could get in three or four. That would start your day at 5.30, you're going to be on the campus. The end of the day, your child will be in a puddle. They won't be excited about any college. There should be joy and excitement in the process. Some of our best memories, we talk about this in our office, are visiting campuses with our parents. We can still remember the nighttime conversation in the hotel. Keeping joy in the process means if you're doing an entire week of spring break visits, two a day, two a day, and maybe on Wednesday, just one college and say to your child, we're gonna be in DC, we're gonna be in Boston, we're gonna be in your, you pick the activity that afternoon. What's something you've always wanted to do? It's kind of amazing. Kids come back and say, oh, I, I visited schools in Chicago, and on Wednesday afternoon, we did the architecture tour by boat, and it was awesome. That's just as important to know that that was the visit to Chicago colleges, and then they also saw some other parts of Chicago. But please remember, these are children, uh, we can't work them to death. It can't be a job to visit colleges. There should be joy in every step of this process, including the campus visit. Um, and I'll take one more and then pass it over. Sometimes your child's reactions will not make sense. We do this arrow. Uh, we hear this all the time. We were at the perfect school. Everything was right. On paper, this, this should have worked out. And the kid opened, they sleep the whole way there. They open one eye when you get to the campus and they say, ugh, Gothic architecture, next. Oh my God, you've spent all that time and energy and money planning the visit. I'm going to tell you, you could just say, sorry, Susie, I've spent all this time and energy and money, and we're doing that damn tour. Or you could say, mm, she's written it off. You know your child best. You know which avenue to take and how much you can or should push your child. But just be prepared for reactions like that. One eye open, gothic architecture, done. Okay, Carla. Oh, yeah, this. Okay, great. Um, so... One thing I want, I, as someone who I spent, I don't know, a lot of years on the college side and a lot of years planning these visit programs and like, inter, you know, meeting students and families when they come up. And you know, when, when the eager parent comes up and says, this is Johnny and Johnny is so excited. And John, I want to hear from Johnny. Like Johnny's the one who's going to be on our campus. So it's not the we, it's not, it's the student. So while you absolutely can help and you should with the planning and all of those logistics really allow the student to be the one who introduces themselves, to be the one who drives the conversation. That is so, so important. And maybe Johnny is a little shy and that's okay. This is a great opportunity, 
you know, admissions people are not scary people. Um, we're humans and we have feelings and we love all of the, you know, Jen and Mateo will definitely tell you that they love working with students. That's why they're there. Um, so not the we, but the I, letting Johnny drive the bus. Um, and then I think we already talked about this a lot, but just keep that open mind. It's, you might be surprised. You might really love a place that you knew zero about, but you happen to be in the area. So you followed our advice and you, you made that visit. And it could be a really lovely surprise and it could be a great fit for your students. So keeping that open mind also really important. Yeah, and just a few things. Um, I would say, you know, if your child is interested in STEM field, go see an Institute of Technology just to see what that's like. I always say an all women's college is a good thing for females to visit, to know that this place that is out there for them. Just the way HBCUs and art institutes and learning a little bit about the types of schools that are out there are important to know about and to research those different programs so you're aware of what um, may be the difference between uh, a Catholic university is than um, you know, a state university. You're sort of learning about the system of higher education and that's really important. Um, I would also, um, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, but, you know, in the demonstrated interest field, we have found that um, this, this college is with the lowest admit rates. So really what you can say is any college with sort of 15% or lower, they don't care about demonstrated interest. They have so many applicants to their schools that that's not something they're going to be measuring and that kids really, you know, typically are, are going to those schools at higher rates. So that's not something that um, is a great uh, differentiator in their process. And the way I like to think about this a little bit is um, political candidates. When they are running for a, a position, where do they spend time if they're on a national scale? The swing states, the swing states. So they don't spend time in a state that, or that much time in a state that they might know that they're gonna win. They maybe, maybe do a drop through, go see and visit. They don't spend time, that much time, in a state where they say, my chances of winning here are not great. You know, they only have, you know, 15%. They spend time in those colleges that we talk about in our office as that sort of, those sort of 50-50 schools. The schools where they can make a difference by showing up on campus and learning a little bit more and places that will be a fit for them. Parents, big things to know in terms of you, don't let them visit colleges that you're not going to support them going to. Um, you know, if you're not going to pay for it, if you're not going to let them go that far, I think you want to have those conversations early and have a sense of that, that you want to explain to them um, what the parameters are. So taking that look into this and recognizing that you all may be ahead of the game on this, meaning more excited than they are. They may be thinking more about prom, when they get their license, um, their spring sport, you know, all these things. They may not be as jazzed about this as you are. So pay attention to this and to your child because we notice they all kind of get there. Um, at some point. Uh, last thing I thought of, of talking about too is, you know, don't be afraid to say, gosh, I'm interested in this sport. Let me just drop by and see if the coach is here. You know, you can do that when you're on campus. I'm really interested in graphic design. I'm going to go just when we're walking through there, that professor looks like they're doing really interesting research. You know, that sort of on the ground um, serendipity of the process, I think, is um, something that can often be overlooked. So we're going to open it up to questions. Um, I really can't tell you what a treat it is to have these experts here. So I will walk around with the mic. If you have a question that you think would be for the good of the order, or if you want to come up individually, anybody want to? A question for the go to the order? No, we were just that thorough. <laughs> yes? Someone said um, eat in the dining hall. You would just stop by. Eat, eat in the dining hall. hall. Uh, you can, How's that work? Sure, stop by, but you can ask in the admissions office when you check in to say, is there a campus dining hall where we could go as a visitor? Some colleges will give you a little visitor pass and you know let you get a meal on them. Um, often they have these cafes or what would you call them, food courts. Any place that you can just sit and observe, a student union or a student center, sit and observe, you will see things that you will absolutely not see on tour that will be just as important and enlightening to you as what you saw on the official tour. Yeah. 
And if your child has a food allergy, I mean, just I'm just sensitive to this. I have a child with a food allergy. We need to know if she's going to be able to eat there, right? So if you have a child who's, we've got all the foods in my house. If you've got a vegan or a celiac, or we, we cover all those bases, my family needs to know, like, can I eat here for four years? So I don't think that's why Mateo would suggest that you do it. I think it's more for the observation character piece than it is for the house of food, because there's not one college campus, not one college kid who's going to say, I love the food here. I wish I could eat it for the next 20 years. They're going to say, I mean, even our dining hall, right? They're going to say, oh, it's pretty good, but... I don't know, the scones were pretty good this morning. So um, I'll just add to that, and, and you mentioned like that serendipity. It is good to plan if you do want to talk to particular individuals, but here's my tip. So we just had a program on Monday during the holiday, and we had mostly juniors, right, and a couple sophomores, a couple seniors. And when we have our registration form, we give students an option. Are you interested in Division Three intercollegiate athletics? Would you like to talk with a coach? Check. You know, would you like to talk? You know, so we give these options. Well, guess who typically fills out that form? Here. You, right? Make sure that you talk with your child before you fill out that form because what happens is they show up at registration and they get the schedule and they're like, I don't want to talk to that person. I wasn't planning to do an interview today and they're not ready. So you plan in advance at the time of registration, what are the expectations for that visit whenever possible. We know that sometimes once you get there, you're excited, you know, you're ready, you're like, hey, we've traveled all the way from Ohio, we're here in Colorado, could we fit something else in? But just keep that in mind that it has to be an appropriate. Um, I'll add one thing for athletes, if you're the parent of a potential collegiate athlete, sometimes the coaches want to do the planning for you. So. Think about that. Ask the coach. Um, I'm married to a college coach. He prefers to do that. So you say, coach, I really want to come on you know, this Friday. And then the coach will say, here's when I'm available. I'm going to do this part of the visit. Then I will contact admissions and get you on a tour and an interview. That's that's the only caveat I would think for, for student athletes is some coaches will want to do it. And then some coaches will say, good luck. Swing by for five minutes. I'll see if I can see. Just be prepared for all the reactions. And I would also say with athletics, it also depends on the division right so if, you, if you've got a student that's looking at a d1 school there are certain times of the year that the coach can actually interact with it with the student athlete other times it's going to be one of their staff members right and so particularly if it's with athletics with a d1 school you want to make sure that you're doing some early outreach and seeing what is possible and usually that there's a, a link or a contact through the athletics website um, the other piece about you know that planning ahead like if there are certain components of a visit that you really want to have happen ask when you call to set that like you can schedule it online but it's okay to call and say hey we're going to be on campus is it possible to do x not always is it going to be possible but most schools if we can we're going to make it work out we're going to stay up here for questions we're cognizant we always try to end right at nine for people to get to work two last things next week is standardized testing the Wednesday after that is a parent coffee on athletic recruiting, and then we're trying something new for students and parents, February 9th. It's an evening program, February 9th. Um, playing, it's a panel about playing college sports. We have an athletic administrator, some college coaches. The really handsome one in the picture is my husband. Just kidding. <laughs> And we have our coach, our athletic staff is going to be here. We're going to be here. We realize that we talk a lot to adults. We try to talk as much to kids as we can as well. So we're trying something in the evening. If your kid is not sure about coming, there will be so much pizza. Just uh, um, please join me in thanking these two experts for joining us. And now we're going to see who paid attention and who's going to come up and get their business card for follow-up, which they have here. And we'll stay here for questions. Thank you, guys.